Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. Yeah, yeah. Well, we had we had like another hour's worth of content, didn't we? Yeah. So we'll just keep going with that. And uh, you know, while we were getting ready for this, um, we were kind of having a conversation about you know what it is we want to talk about exactly today. And the way that I framed it was that Marcus and I are most familiar with turkey behavior by looking at dots on a map. And what I'm referring to there is GPS locations. And so one of the things that we're really excited about, and, you know, we just recently talked to some other animal behaviorists that have directly observed turkeys uh, for various experiments. And then today we have on turkey royalty, right? Oh, Miss yeah. Tess Jolly is in the no house. Question. She's actually uh, actually in my <laughs> office. Those of you that watch regularly yeah. probably recognize that. We tried to we tried to sit across the desk from each other, but, you know, Tess, you know, Tess lives just down the road from Auburn, so... She yeah. was able to make it up, and um, we were hoping to sit across the desk from each other, but there was just too much echo. Um, so we, we, we came up you, with this alternative situation. I'm pretty impressed, Tess, that you were able to just walk into Auburn and push Will out of his office. <laughs> no. of but he's not letting me put my name up, though. <laughs> yeah, even your, your uh, panel is still named Goolsby. Yeah. Well, I like to be close to the turkeys, and, and this is – just fine yeah. with this big fella behind Well, me. if this if if today does not demystify your perception of me, I don't know what will because Yes. it's an honor to be here, guys. I I really uh happy to be here and and love all the work that you all are doing. I learned so much from your podcast. Well, it's really special to have you here too and and talking to you um at at times in the past and then you know talking to similar folks who have just spent hours and hours and hours just watching observing and learning from turkeys marcus can tell you that it stimulates ideas for Mm -hmm. us that that drive our research so i mean you know that those observations and the ideas that are stimulated from them can sometimes be really invaluable yeah there's no question about that and it's also inspiring me. Like I was just telling you, I was out in the field this morning. I'm, you know, actively trying to be a part of uh, the field operations on our turkey project. And we're, we have some observational stuff going on. And, you know, I'm trying to take after you and spend some time with the birds. And, you know, when they're not going to die at the end of it, I guess, you know, yeah. I get to see the whole thing play out instead of, uh, you know, ending it during the middle of the show. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of photography. It's it's the same as hunting. You're just recycled hunting. You've got a mm-hmm. trigger on your camera, and you know I say boom a lot of times if it's a really nice bird, <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> might get another uh, chance at him. You know, I, I'm yeah. recycling Catching him. Release. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> know, it's boom I, and release. I know for me, <laughs> you know, that was a. I've never I've never really done it with turkeys, but. You know, when I started um, hunting properties that were managed for older older age class deer, and especially when I combine that with bow hunting, I feel like that is when my number of observations and my uh, knowledge about whitetail behavior, you know, from actually physically observing the animals really began to grow. So I could definitely see how that'd be the case, you know, f- photographing turkeys too. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you let it just play out, especially if you're not calling to them, because I don't call to them a lot unless I feel like I need to, or I want to make them react in a certain way, or if there's nothing happening, I'm cold calling like I would on a turkey hunt and all. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, you you get to see 
what happens, like if, if somebody has a decoy out or there's an interaction going on with a hen or some jakes, if you shoot the bird, you don't know what plays out. And decoys, whether you're a fan or not, um, I don't use them photographing much, but I do uh, like to get the reactions because it is a legal method of hunting. And I, I like to see some of the other behavior you know, leading up to coming to a decoy where they think they're coming to a hen and all. But, um, you know, I, I've seen Longbeard stay with a decoy until dark and yeah. be so zoned in. They didn't even see my husband drive up this. And, and we don't I don't photograph in the backyard. This is all out in the on the farm in the wild. But I had a Longbeard that was so zoned into that decoy that I was texting my husband. I said, just ease on down here. It was a 300 yard long food plot. And that bird ignored that silver truck, you you know, (laughs) until he was, (laughs) until he was right up there about 40 yards away. And I've got Jolly in the truck and the gobbler with the hen and me and the blind all lined up. And it it took him about a minute before he finally looked around, but, turkeys can get in a zone there's no mm-hmm. doubt about that when and didn't you say didn't you say that you told you've told me that story before and i and i if i recall right it was after fly up time oh yeah yeah i mean yeah, I, i've seen that a number of times with decoys they'll they'll peck the eye out they really go for the eyeball and these really um realistic ones like the dsd hen that i mm-hmm. i use they paint them and they've got the catch light in that eye and um, I mean, the hens will do the same thing. You get a boss hen and she will stay there and stay there and get on that hen decoy. And that's usually a little later in the season. Um, I usually don't throw a decoy out there until the hens are already have laid mm-hmm. their nest, their clutch, and they're starting to incubate. And you've got those gobblers that are lonesome and they're, they're out hanging around in the afternoons near where the hens are nesting and just I looking throw for some a, trouble to get yeah, into <laughs> yeah and i can put a squatting hen down in a jake decoy and they you know they don't like it and yeah you can you know the hens will do the same thing they're they're territorial and um they go for the eye boy it's amazing well, you kind of inspired a a question for me related to that you were saying you wanted to see the how behavior of them approaching mm-hmm. a decoy compared, I guess, to to just an uninhibited, you know, un uh, unfeathered behavior. It, are there any differences other than that's a pretty obvious one where they they're sticking around even after fly up with it? Or are there other things that you've picked up on? Over yeah. the years that differ about how they interact with a decoy versus when they're just interacting with each other? Um, I don't know uh, if there's a term, another term for it, but I call it high heading. When uh, And this is usually with uh, live hens um, when they're approaching and I might not see them. But I've seen it. I see it in jakes, too, and I see it in hens, but it's a dominance behavior mm. where they point their beak as high and the gobblers will stand up taller. And mm-hmm. their shoulder, I call it the shoulder pads, their feathers on the, on the butt of the wing will stand up. And that's, I see that a lot in, during these dominance displays when they, they yeah. do the high head. And, and you can tell if there's just one bird in the field, which I've seen it a lot. And, all, you know, all of a sudden he's, um, his, his tail will bounce. I've seen the gobbler's yeah. tail mm-hmm. bounce and the feathers come up. And the head come up, and, and at times they'll do a whine. And usually there's either a pack of bull jakes coming, or there's a couple of other dominant birds coming. But th- th- that's a signal that a hunter can use, you know, when they're hunting is watch how those birds behave. Because you may mm-hmm. not see it, but there's something getting ready to happen. So, you know, it can really help you if you're, if you're hunting. But they do yeah. give you a lot of clues uh, yeah. 
So when you're when you're saying high heading, do you you mean the beak is literally like pointed straight? Yeah, up? they point it they point it up and the and they'll stand really oh. tall. I mean, I've got a lot of photos of that, and the hens yeah. will do that as a dominance posture. You know, they'll flare their tail. They'll they'll go into a strut. I mean, I've mm-hmm. photographed hens strutting, mm-hmm. and uh, you know that's usually your boss hen. I mean, she's she's herding the the other girls around mm-hmm. uh, within mm-hmm. the flock and all but um uh yeah the the behaviors right now the hens are uh fighting among themselves some they're they're settling down a little bit on our place but when you get a couple of gobblers strutting and the hens start fighting the hen it's it's i see it all the time the hen that's getting chased will run in and around those strutters and do like little figure eights trying to lose those other hens it's <laughs> it's really uh, if you've never seen it, it's pretty comical. She'll duck mm-hmm. underneath and, and kind of get, get out of the way so they can't see her. So, mm-hmm. um, but, and just little things like when the birds are going to leave the field, you know, like if you're, if you're not sure whether that bird is going to, has busted you or is getting ready to leave, you know, they'll usually check their wings. Most turkey hunters know when a bird brings his, his wings up a little bit. Not necessarily the wing stretch, but they'll do a wing stretch when they're getting ready to leave the field, whether they're scared or not. But um, that little that little wing check means he's fixing a turn. Usually, I mean, I, I don't say always or never with turkeys because they'll make a liar <laughs> out of you. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's no absolutes with them, but um, it's it's pretty interesting to see all the little the little behaviors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tess, you mentioned fighting a couple of times, and one thing I really wanted to ask you about today is kind of when in the in the year do you see the most intense fighting among gobblers? Because I think we typically think of that occurring during the hunting season, but I've also heard that it could happen well before that. And yeah, I, I mean, I kind of had a similar question when we were talking about the hens trying to lose each other. When you know, it was similar. I wanted to know when are you seeing that happening during the during the year too. The for Will's question, the just from being out there and and watching them over a lot of years, um, the the most vicious fights that I've seen and and photographed where they really were trying to hurt each other was between two mature gobblers when the when the hens are on the nest, but they still mm-hmm. want to breed. They've still mm-hmm. got that testosterone up. They've got that urge. And it's usually at our place in East Central Alabama, that's third week of April. Um, mm-hmm. You know, those gobblers are moving. They're looking for hens that are popping out to dust in the afternoons and peck a little bit. And, you know, I have the the luxury of photographing some of the same birds year to year because we don't necessarily mm-hmm. hunt them on our place so i can i can see a bird like lover boy that was a bird i photographed for six years and wow the, he taught me more about spring i didn't shoot him much any other time but from february to to the end of or middle of may but um you know there's just the fighting, those old birds, uh, I had a fight that lasted 24 minutes. I timed it. And those two birds really wanted to kill each other. And wow. they did a lot of the, the beak stabbing down the throat and all. Mm-hmm. Usually the fights now are groups. You know, it's just a melee. Mm-hmm. It's like a barnyard brawl. But when you get two mature birds that square off and they do, they, they approach each other like a prize fighter. They they mantle those wings like a mm. like a hawk would and they make themselves really big and when they start going with the spurs that one actually you could see a drop of blood on the breast feather so i know he made contact through all that mm-hmm. breast feathers into the chest on that one that and it was it was 24 minutes and their mouths when the the, the what they try to do a lot of the time is bulldog the other bird when they Mm -hmm. really fight 
they'll try to twist their necks. And I see them wrap necks, but what they do is they'll get them in a, in a beak lock and then bear down with them and twist them. And if they can get them off balance enough times, usually that one will, he'll run and mm. fights over. But, um, yeah, I'd say when the nest, when the birds, when the hens are on the nest, that's when I've seen the most vicious fights. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's not what I would have expected you to answer because I, really? you know, I, I would think that they would. <laughs> well, I, I would have just thought, and, and I'm just going off, you know, of intuition here. But mm-hmm. you, you would think that they would want to kind of sort that uh, that dominance out before really the breeding starts. And you're saying it's kind of when they're, the hens are on the nest, but they still have that elevated testosterone and they're looking for something to do. Well, that's that's really interesting to me. And I, I think too, uh, Will. Their, their paths cross at that time of year. You've, you've got a lot of right. your younger birds have been shot. They're gone. You've got your older birds that are seasoned. They, they've had their routes. But they cover a lot of ground. I, I know just from listening to the gobbling, there, there's usually, you know, they'll gobble in the afternoons walking, trying to, you know, they're just out trolling, trying to see if they can find a hen that's lost her nest or, you know, abandoned mm-hmm. it or whatever. And, um and that's a happy gobbler in late April or early May that finds a hen that has lost her nest for whatever reason, and she's coming back into the fields and stuff. Mm-hmm. Boy, he'll get he'll get on her and stick with her. And mm-hmm. um, those are some really good opportunities for me for photography, plus to watch the behavior because you'll have some of those jakes that everybody hates you know nobody wants the jakes around at that point uh coming in so you get some uh you get some really good uh interaction at that at that time so it's like starting spring over again almost and i see (laughs) breedings clear up to the end of april you know Mm -hmm. they'll they'll still still breed Mm -hmm. but they do try to kill each other i mean there's some there's some knockdown drag outs yeah I had a question that came to mind when you were talking through that, and you said uh, you had the the one named Lover Boy that you've yeah. known for a long time. What are you? How, how do you know that it's uh, the same turkey? Is it like the? Does it have like a unique marking on it, or is it something like? What are you? How are you? I can give you a real smart Alec remark, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I learned from uh, photography, when you look at your photos and you're zooming in, I'm always intrigued. I should have, if if I could do my life over, I'd be sitting in a desk like you guys. I'd be a wildlife biologist studying turkeys. Um, You know, I sweat (laughs) the details. I love the details of, of learning. I love to learn, but um, the crown, the skull cap is what I call it. It's just like a fingerprint on us. When you zoom into that skull cap, especially when they're excited, you know, when they're slick down and they're, you know, not excited, the crown doesn't look like a whole lot. But when it swells, they have a definite signature wrinkles that are there. And I can identify, and Loverboy had a certain um, wrinkle pattern to his crown. Plus, he had an extended gobble. Uh, mm-hmm. that was just a, a very signature gobble. I knew that gobble, and he had a, a, a very unique brush beard. And he lived, I mean, between our property and us. He was the, he was the king of spring in that one big field <laughs> for six springs. And the last spring that I saw him, he was, he was at least three when I first saw him started photographing him some jakes came in he was he came into the field and and he was strutting and some jakes came in and they started terrorizing him well he whipped them and i mean he he sent them packing so i got real interested in him i thought well this is a tough bird here and he he ruled the roost there for six springs but the last spring he was old and he came in trailing three mature gobblers and i i used to spend afternoons with him during incubating time he would come into that field and get under a big red oak and squat in the grass and he'd put his head up like a periscope watching for the hens 
uh, through, you know, in the heat of the day. And I would just purr and cluck and scratch leaves in the blind and he'd strut around the blind. So we had this relationship and I was spending every day, some days, all day. And Jolly, my husband would say, you know, you spend more time with that gobbler than you do me. And I said, yeah, he's my lover boy. <laughs> and that's how he got named. That was the second year. He said, don't you get tired of sitting out there? I said, no, <laughs> he's just, and it was a, it was a very unique, I, I did a story about it. And I don't think I've ever connected with a wild animal to where I could purr and cluck and he would respond and come and he w- he thought there was a little shy hen in that blind, scratching leaves, and he would. But that was where he hung out, and I hung out. And then when the hen came in, he went to her. Mm-hmm. But it was it was a neat little distraction for him. He didn't know that it was a distraction, but it was it was um, a gift from God from me. It really was. Mm-hmm. It was, and it was practically every day. I mean, I really I kept a journal. And uh, he was a special That's bird, amazing. real special bird. Yeah, I, I did not expect you to tell me that you're looking at their forehead fingerprint. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have a, and their caruncles down below are very unique. We have one right yeah. now that's got the left cur- main caruncle is higher than the right. And I don't see that very often. Most of the time they're, they're in a definite configuration, but one of they're pretty matched like a big couple of big cherries. Mm-hmm. This one is short on the other side. So, uh, you know, he's real easy to, to ident- mm-hmm. identify. Mm-hmm. The skull cap takes a little bit more, uh, in, you know, to, I got to get it on the computer, but, um, they, they have their personalities to, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> y'all probably know that all of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all wild animals have creatures have some kind of personality. Some are aggressive, some aren't and, and all, mm-hmm. but, um, some are scarier than others. You know, they, they run easier, but, um, yeah, I, the hens are a little bit harder, but I've even, um, looked at the barring on the wings mm. and then compared it uh, mm-hmm. because they're, that's like a fingerprint as well. I mean, yeah. and I even have a, had a gobbler at the farm last year with Osceola barring and he's very black. Uh, yeah. I, you know, it, that's the first time I've had them with solid black primaries, but this one was just like an Osceola. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen him this year. He was an old bird. Uh, but yeah, each one of them, you, you can identify them if you, could get the photos <laughs> so, so one of the things that i've been really interested to ask because you know these individuals you're out there so often and sometimes you're not just watching them every day but you're watching the same bird year after year mm-hmm. um how predictable are they in those circumstances like did they i mean do they not show up some days and other days they do or when they're unmolested and you've got these mature birds do they generally just kind of roost in the same area and fly down to the same area and have the same daily routine? Well, I think that all gets worked out during the the fall and winter is whoever's dominant and, mm-hmm. and can maintain it. I, I, I tell people every day is a new day in the turkey woods because somebody can get their butt whipped <laughs> and they're mm-hmm. not necessarily on top, but they can fight back to that. So you have your the birds that stay dominant every year like Loverboy did. He was an exception. He was a big, tough bird. And and it, it's like bucks. You know, some bucks don't even have to fight because the other bucks just know they're tough. They can look at mm-hmm. them and tell. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, Loverboy had two different roosts. We didn't hunt there, so he was unmolested. He had two of his favorite roosts. One was out of drain in a big um, grass area. There's a hardwood drain. Another one was right on our property line. And I could bank on him being in one of those two places if he mm-hmm. wasn't molested. But, you know, you get a coyote run through, you don't know where your turkeys are going to be. Or a bobcat, right. climb a tree. Uh, that's why there's just no absolutes. But, yeah, these birds... If they're not hunted and, and scared, they they tend to fall into a routine other than it's really related to the habitat and the food sources and the time mm-hmm. of year. You know that, sure. that they're going to mm-hmm. change according to that. But during the spring, when I do the most of it, 
they can they can get in a habit of of being in a general area if mm-hmm. nobody's hunting them hard and calling that to them sense. and everything i think they are creatures of habit they do roam you know we all know turkeys mm-hmm. cover a lot of land mm-hmm. uh, ground but if they've got good habitat which is what you know we're all about is providing everything we can i think it they tend to not travel as much in it mm-hmm. in the winter we don't have winters like you have up north they have to go places where there's food here they've got it pretty easy in general mm-hmm. but we didn't have acorns this year it was they were gone by the end of november so our deer and our turkeys had no hard mast so mm-hmm. they've been in the in the food plots pulling grass you know yeah wheat mm-hmm. and that sort of thing really really hard this year yeah. you could you could put golf balls on our food plots and the mm-hmm. exclusion rings are up you know thigh deep um yeah so they're a little more predictable they're not roaming they're coming to those food plots right now yeah mm-hmm. the clover's well, coming to- up and all that I hate to make you tell the same story twice in the same day, but I think you won't mind. But you were telling me earlier, uh, I, I think it was before we connected with Marcus, about a uh, a breeding event that you were able to to witness earlier today. Uh, yeah, it was yesterday morning. Yesterday, that's yeah. right. This big bird, um, I call him Big Daddy. He's just, he's an old bird. He's got hooks and he's got some I love bar- these names. Yeah, I know. Well, I got to name them. <laughs> I, I got, I, you, yeah, wait, you, you got to hear some of these. I got Cool Whip too. Well, I, yeah, I heard about Cool Whip yeah, on, your, on but, another podcast. Uh, how but, do you know him? Is it based on his forehead or his crunkles or his wing bars. Yeah, yeah, it was his um, forehead. It looked like a big dollop of Cool Whip melting, and I couldn't get the okay. catch light in his eyes because it was yeah. it hung over his eyes so bad that you couldn't get his eyes. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I haven't heard about Big Daddy, so I'm wondering. If- well, Big Daddy is just a big bird, but he's got a little bit of barring in his center two tail feathers, so oh. he's really easy to, to identify, and uh, he is the man this year um there's two or three other long beards there that are old birds they've got real curve but um he's got breeding rights right now nobody's whipped him off of it but he bred two hens within he bred one and then within he just went walking away and another little hen went right up to him and what was unique about those two um usually they have that breeding pose where they kind of go mm. like they're in a trance the little hen they'll stand and they'll their head will be down and they'll just be really still and that gobbler will strut around them and then they'll squat well these two hens the one that was closest to me she would drop her wings and i showed the photo to to will just her first about four or five primaries she would drop down to the ground and stand and then she'd walk around him and she'd do it again. And she did it three times. And then she just slowly lay her down, low, lower down. And I hadn't really seen that that many times where that rather than doing that pose where they just kind of crouch and look down, she was standing up and she had those wings kind of dropped. And then when he went over to the other hand, she did something different. And it, it was, I told Will, it was such a pretty morning yesterday. The sun was out and the, the iridescence on these birds, I, I really do believe, like you all say, that they choose the best looking gobbler. Mm-hmm. I mean, I really do think that they're attracted by all that iridescence. And this other hen did little runs around, trots around that gobbler, and she would brush against him, his wings, you know, and right underneath his chest. And she made three or four circles around him just real tight and then squatted and he bred her. Um, which I thought was, you know, that was, I see that some, but that was really cool to see two different ways that the hens kind of made a signal to the gobbler. They were ready to, to breed. So, and the Jakes were just, they went crazy. <laughs> Jakes are, you want to observe Jakes <laughs> you need to come out when that's happening. Oh my gosh. They're they're like teenage boys. <laughs> just, they just don't know what they're to all. Do. No, they're yeah. just watching and they're like jumping and like I know this. Well, 
that that's really really interesting and i love hearing you talk about it because you clearly you're passionate about it and and you're spent your life engaged you know in in uh, this kind of behavior when you were observing that based you, you were talking about it being sunny and how pretty the birds were and iridescent mm-hmm. do you think that they changed their ritual because they were engaged in that more iridescent i mean is that what you, you know, were interpreting the, it is or the observation part of it the nice thing is i've got proof of it because i videoed it <laughs> you know yeah. that's and when you go back and look because i you know i i forget a lot but you know, I'm, I'm at that age where you can forget <laughs> what you saw or you can think what you saw and it wasn't necessarily what you saw mm-hmm. but yeah videoing it and and photographing it makes it better but they when i looked at it there was more excitement yesterday morning in all the birds it was a, we've had all these heavy dirty sock cloudy days you know where it's just funky but yesterday morning it was just beautiful we had gorgeous light that hits early before it burns out and, and gets glaring and all and those gobblers look their best in that early morning light um, that we all like to photograph in and there just was more excitement in the whole flock. Um, the hens were chasing each other around. The jakes were all, you know, they do that a lot, but they were really, and then, and then there were two jakes that were strutting. And I was a little surprised that those gobblers let them do that. But it was like everybody wanted to just get in the, hmm. in the program yesterday. <laughs> and then this morning it was dirty sock, dar- dark again. And uh, there wasn't near the, the activity you know, mm-hmm. that I didn't mm-hmm. see any breedings. They just kind of came out there, fed, ran around with the jakes a little bit. But uh, the gobblers just followed the hens, and none of the hens seemed intent on anything other than just feeding and preening. And they spend so much of their time preening. It mm-hmm. just amazes me how much, you know, they've got a lot of work to do every day mm-hmm. on their plumage. Every mm-hmm. single day they have to do that think if that's that's one thing they've taught me is just how much time it takes for them to maintain uh the you know their plumage is what keeps them alive you know mm-hmm. they, they, right. it serves so many purposes for it and those gobblers they you can't get anything any prettier than the the iridescence on a on a sunny morning early that's and mm-hmm. i think the hens respond to that to answer your question just as mm. an impression i can't ask them and have them answer but yeah. <laughs> it, it, it it excites me so i'm a woman so i figure they are too <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <laughs> tess hey. i'm curious on on some of those those older dominant birds that um that you've observed kind of being the primary breeders have you have you ever noticed they especially like when they're when they're displaying and on the display grounds do you notice that they gobble less than some of the other birds or have you ever noticed a hen being put off by a strutting bird gobbling because this is something I've, and I'll give you the context for my question you know a couple of weeks ago I was telling you earlier that we had talked to an animal behaviorist and he had done some research on captive turkeys looking at all sorts of things like you know what is it that hens see in gobblers that lead to them choosing to mate with that gobbler and so on and that was something that he had noticed with those captive birds and i've wondered if it was maybe just because they were in a more confined space Mm -hmm. but he said that if a gobbler was strutting and the hen was drawn to it and marcus help me out if i miss an aspect of this but that if that bird then gobbled that it seemed like the hen kind of found that off putting Hmm. Have you ever seen like anything like that out in the not, field? No, not not really. In fact, I think that, it, I mean, it proves it to me that they're attracted or they answer the call of the gobble at fly down. Like right now, mm-hmm. those those gobblers hit the ground first. All of them came down. Jake's right along with them. Then the hens start coming in and they gobble and there'll be a flurry of hens and they gobble and there'll be a flurry of hens. Mm-hmm. And of course, they're doing their cackles and calls. Um, I, I don't think I've ever noticed where one would, you know, mm-hmm. dodge away from a, a gobble ever. Um, mm-hmm. I, I would tend to think anytime you crowd something in, you know, in an unnatural 
space sure. that that might um, affect them, you know, negatively. Right. But I really think they uh, they are, they tend to be. It's an answer to that that call. They come to them. And they right. know exactly how many hens have not flown down. I've seen that three mornings in a row. I'm glad house. you brought this up. There's <laughs> always a hen up there that's got the biggest mouth. It's the last one to come down. And yesterday and the day before, she stayed up there and she trash talked <laughs> from the tree after <laughs> everybody was down. And three of the gobblers went up the hill. To her area where she was, and she flew down, and they escorted her back down two mornings in a row. Hmm. And I'm like, she just playing hard to get. <laughs> but she was the most vocal one, and this is just anecdotal. You know, this is what I'm seeing this year. I have a really unique opportunity this year in a new spot, different than where I typically do. So hmm. I'm I'm really getting to see the whole flock and be close uh you know i go get up in the wee wee hours to get in there in the dark and get set up and not spook anybody so they mm -hmm. you know that that's that's a, one of the big challenges for me is to get in and get close enough to where i can really um get to see some of that stuff but they they do um they do seem to know, those gobblers in this situation seem to know when the last hen is down, whether she's talking or not. They hung around this morning, and there was still two hens that I didn't hear, but they knew were up there. And they didn't move with the flock of hens until those two hit the ground, and then they went down. Mm. And I, uh, it's almost like they've got a head count on on who's available and and they're going to make sure they're all down and coming before. But to see them go up the hill and then come back down was pretty cool. I thought, man, she's in makes, control. <laughs> makes me wonder how, how in the in world control. do I ever kill one? <laughs> I know. It does. Doesn't it? Well I, was, well, I was also thinking, you know, maybe you do have a chance when they're henned up too, you know. like, But, but is, if, you're, if, you're, you're, if they know that they're looking for 13 hens and you end up being number 14, do they care enough to go back up the hill and get number 14? Yeah. Or do they know, know something's up? Or yeah. do they know something's up? <laughs> I mean, I like I say, I, people listening to this podcast, I'm not saying that every gobbler right. is going to do a head count. I right. just know what happened multiple times on, and I've seen it before. They kind of hang around where they first fly down, especially if it's in a field situation, which I have that luxury right now. I've got a food plot. Uh, they're not flying down in the timber. So um, I've made a head count of the flock. I know how many are going to be coming in. And those gobblers seem to know too, because they're not, they don't, they haven't been moving from that f where they put their feet on the ground until everybody's down. And then mm. they, then they move unless it was like that one that was so loud. I mean, it was, she was calling like she was almost like she was either mad or, <laughs> I, she wasn't spooked. It wasn't that kind of, it was just uh springtime talk. <laughs> it's like and she's up they there responded. Being, yeah. It's like she's up there being obstinate because she knows she's the boss yeah. and she and, can do what she wants. <laughs> and when you turkey hunt, you can do that. You can call in trash talking uh, like a hen yeah. does. Mm -hmm. and, sure. and to see them just pack up there and leave everybody else and go up the hill and then come back down with her. I can see why birds in the right situation get shot because mm. they think that's that, think it's a hen that needs to mm. join them. Unless it's Marcus up the hill calling. In. <laughs> yeah, that never happens when I'm the hen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's when you want to know where they're going. <laughs> that's uh, my, yeah. I think if you that's know where they're happens. going, you will kill a turkey. Yeah. That's that's I, my motto. <laughs> especially when you call like I do. <laughs> and me too. <laughs> that's I, what I I'm realizing is sometimes my calling deters them from going where they were going to go. <laughs> yeah. And then sometimes my calling doesn't deter them from going where they want to go. And I happen to be in their way. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. I hear you. Well, I, I tell you, I've heard 
some really bad calling on these hens. I mean, you should, I, yeah. I, I told my husband, I said, I don't feel bad at all because I use my voice a lot because I want to use my hands on the camera. And these hens, there is some of the worst yelping and the jakes are just, you know, they, they have some of the most irritating yowks that they do. Yow, but yow, the hen, yow. yeah. And they do that to the drumming, the the spit and drum. You yeah. can you I mean it if you're hunting and you hear Jake's going bah, 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 like that, yelking, calking, there's good chance there might be a gobbler spitting and drumming. Cause that mm-hmm. I mean, they're right out in front of me every time he spits and drums. There'll be one Jake that just can't stand it. He's got a calc at it. Mm-hmm. Um but they're entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> so when you you were describing it a little bit a few minutes ago but are you going out well before they wake up in the morning and getting in the blind and then not leaving until after they go to bed no not i haven't in a couple of three years i used to okay. when i had a uh when i first started i i took my yoga mat and i have a big lucky's blind that is big enough I can stand in but it's really easy to move and I would pretty much spend the day and at that time my mom and dad were alive and I just called mom and I said I'm going to stay because they're not far I wanted to catch that midday behavior Mm -hmm. what they do and see those gobblers come out to feed because they don't eat much they're like you know buck deer they those gobblers Mm -hmm. between 10 and 2 usually are going to be finding something to eat and i'd have dad drive by and just throw a bag lunch in the window of my blind and leave (laughs) and i'd stay and i you know i I, i've done that in the past now i've got a little bit more organized to where i can get in and get out or have jolly come and push the you know spook the birds really easy which i say i just need them pushed you know if there if there's Mm -hmm. birds around but i i do not try to scare a bird. That's one of my cardinal sins is to spook birds. I, I'll stay mm-hmm. if I need to because I don't want them to fly. Yeah. I just, mm-hmm. That's the worst thing I can do is is get impatient and make birds fly. Yeah. Because that upsets That's, that's kind of what I was thinking is you're obviously getting in there and out of there without the Oh, yeah. Knowing. Yeah. So, we're there. I was curious what you were doing. Yeah. I, sometimes I belly crawl. Sometimes I have to leave everything <laughs> in the blind and I just belly crawl out and go to the house and then come back after dark. But I get up really early. I get in there an hour before any kind of light and they're gobbling and waking up 550 right now <clears throat> at our place. They're, mm-hmm. you know, you start hearing them, um, on a clear morning, it'll be earlier than that. It'll be 5.30. Um, mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. on these cloudy mornings, it's usually about 5.45. So I've got to get in there before 5, you know, when you're mm-hmm. out in the open like that. But it's a, it's a, it's a challenge, and it's fun. It's <laughs> just like hunting. I mean, I get my turkey fix. People say, don't you like turkey hunt anymore? I say, honey, I'm turkey hunting every day, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I just, mean, I understand. I meant it for the the behavior and seeing mm-hmm. all the everything play out. I I really am fascinated with with what they're doing and how they interact with other species, all, all those sorts of things. I completely can relate. Yeah, I saw something I've never seen. Uh, Jolly and I were up in Tennessee in December, and it was cold no snow but super white thick frost and on two different mornings uh, there was a group of eight long beards two of them would hit the ground and pop into strut and squat in strut with the tail yeah, the fans up. yeah and that. i that have remarkable. something about those two birds and the way things were uh it was just a gobbler group um and then they eventually got with some hens, but uh, I had never seen that, seen them keep that fan up. There was those two, and there was a huge fight going on behind them in the background between some jakes and longbeards. 
and they just and they'd close their eyes like they were still sleepy. That's what gets me. I mean, they're just it, it was it was remarkable to see. It really was. I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, you never it. quit learning. You, ne- you yeah. just never well, quit. That's that's one of the thing that's kind of remarkable to me. The amount of time you have spent with turkeys, and you're mm-hmm. still seeing things you've never seen regularly mm. it sounds like mm-hmm. yeah yeah that was um those two things this year the breeding poses on their or the acceptant pose i don't know what you call them technically um <laughs> foreplay whatever <laughs> it just um that that fascinates me it tells me that each hen is an individual too you mm-hmm. know they have their own behaviors uh that they that they do but um <laughs> I, I I enjoy it very very much. One of the things that Marcus just mentioned was you know how much he was talking about how much he enjoys watching turkeys interact with other species. Um, are there any you know memorable instances that you've had watching turkeys interact with other species? I mean, whether it be you know a relatively benign interaction with something that's not really a turkey predator or even you know a, a predator species. Um. Uh, yeah, the I, I when I'm in food plots, you've, I've got deer usually. You know, in Alabama, mm-hmm. we've got deer all the time. Um, the little yearlings or the fawns will interact a lot with those turkeys, mm-hmm. and they they'll come up there. and And we had one, and he's four four and a half years old now. I call him Bully. He's a beautiful white uh, uh, buck. And when he was a fawn, he was chasing turkeys, bulldogging them <laughs> like a like. And I've got pictures of him goosing a hen, and chasing gobblers. He just had a thing about turkeys in his food plot. You know, he'd come out in the morning with his with the mother or the doe, and when the turkeys came in, he was going to start chasing them around. Um, I had a uh, a black phase coyote come out once. Um, but there wasn't really an interaction. There were deer and turkeys, but it came out with a cottontail, a full-grown cottontail in its oh, mouth. Wow. So I knew everything was probably going to be okay. Yeah. Um, and that I videoed it. Um, were because, you able to? Okay. Yeah, I was going to say if you were able to shoot it. I, I videoed it eating that cottontail in three and a half minutes. It had that full-grown t- cottontail. It just kind of like crunched it and swallowed it. In one piece, uh-huh. it tore a little bit off. The rest of it went down in gulps. It was amazing. Uh, and the deer wow. didn't didn't really run. They didn't feel threatened, I guess, because they saw that it had a meal. Um, but uh, that was that was pretty good. And hawks, I've seen hawks um, swoop down, and the turkeys, man, they just fan that tail. If you ever, you've seen them run with their tails fanned out and their head way up high uh if they do that um usually it's an overhead you'll see them turn their heads up looking Mm -hmm. at the sky they're they're very aware of aerial predators uh you Mm -hmm. know i've photographed a lot of that i saw turkeys um surround a snake um uh on the side of the field and if you've read joe hutto's um Mm -hmm. Uh, illumination in the flatwoods um he talked about them being very very curious about snakes and Mm -hmm. i even bought a rubber snake a nice long Uh black one and did a setup to see if i could get some better shots of of it and um it was late in the year last year so i haven't done it yet i saved that for another time i don't do that but just in the right situation with a bunch of jakes mm-hmm. or something. But they did. They surrounded that snake, and their heads were all up, and they're you know they're looking. They're very very curious about a snake. Mm. But That's super fascinating. Hogs I haven't seen. Uh, I mean, I had one hog come in when I had a hen in the field, and I I got a picture of both of them in the frame. But that hog had been shot and was really thin, and was not aggressive. It was. In fact, I, ca- I texted Ron. I said, "You need to bring the rifle back here and shoot this hog," and he did. But deer hate the hogs. You know, they're they're mm-hmm. going to clear out usually. But yeah. uh, that's the only hog inter interaction. But I've had hogs come in when I'm photographing 
turkeys, but mm-hmm. um, I just yeah, think it they seems like get out of the way of them. It seems like that's been my experience with you know turkeys and deer relative to you know coyotes or other predators or pigs that you know they just don't want to be around Mm -hmm. it's like as long as they're out in the open and they can see it from a distance they're okay Mm -hmm. it's it's when the other it's when that other animal surprises them or in their in close quarters is when they're gonna you know they're gonna bolt out of there now i yeah and i i've seen um turkeys get really really alert and then and and deer will do the same thing and there's something off the field edge and mm-hmm. it ends up, I get to catch a glimpse of a bobcat, a full grown mm-hmm. bobcat. And I think they're very, very aware of, of bobcats. Um, and I've found hen carcasses that look like they've been plucked. And one biologist told me that that's more than likely it was a bobcat that they'll mm-hmm. pluck them, you know, find just mm-hmm. a lot of feathers and maybe just mm-hmm. the wing tips. Um, our nest predators on our place are raccoons, you know, we, mm-hmm. uh, raccoons and possums and they get, they even find them in those, ra- those blackberry thickets. You know, that's, that's mm-hmm. the thing. It, you, you've got to stay on the predators to keep them under control, just at least during this nesting season, mm-hmm. you know, just get, Because they're going to replace. I mean, somebody else is going to come in. But if you can knock them back while they're in that critical period, I, I really think that's important. And our neighbors, we, we, we cooperate with our neighbors and let each other know what we're trapping, and seeing. And that's between hogs and nest predators. And when we're Mm -hmm. both hitting hitting them really hard from March, middle February until April whatever the seasons are in your area, but it's really critical right, right now. Cause there's, there'll be a void until, you know, some others come in, but I think supplemental feeding has made our nest predators more prolific. I've, I've seen raccoons with five little ones. Mm. Um, you know, we're putting a table out there. For some people that feed year round, we don't do mm. that. Uh, you're feeding a lot of nest predators and just they're having more babies and there's more, ba- you know, more of them mm-hmm. to find turkey nests. Yeah. That's yeah, my that's... opinion. Now, that's I'm not <laughs> asking you to agree, well, but we, I, I really believe the nest predators. Yeah, predator. this is something that we've talked about a lot. And, <laughs> yeah, I know. And, uh, and Tess, you were telling me that, that you and Jolly were, um, you know, had, had some windshield time recently where you were listening to that episode that we did about, you know, talking about habitat management as predator management and how fire, you know, mm-hmm. c- tends to push a lot of those nest predators out of the uplands where the hens like to nest. And um, as a follow up to that, there were a lot of listeners that reached out and asked, you know, what do you think it is that's causing that behavioral response from the predators? And I assumed that it was probably related to food resources, but I wasn't sure. So I went back and I looked up several raccoon in particular, right? Uh, food habit studies. And there were many of them that were done many decades ago, back when there was still really high interest in raccoons as a game species, right? So right. we were looking at, we were look, actually looking <laughs> then at, 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 at providing quality raccoon habitat, mm-hmm. uh, which mm-hmm. is interesting to, to look back on yeah. today. But, um, but there were several studies that, and this was, you know, back during an era where there was very little feeding and baiting of wildlife. Mm -hmm. And even then you would still see that in, in several studies, corn was the number one food item, uh, both in terms of how many of the coon, uh, digestive systems or scats, however they were measuring it it as number one item that showed up in those. And then when it did show up, it was comprised the majority of the food that had been consumed by weight. And, um, that was really interesting and, yeah. and revealing to yeah. me because everybody knows raccoons love corn, but just seeing it quantified like that Absolutely. made an impression on me. Yeah. It was definitely the dominant food item in the raccoon that, uh, diet study diet. that I was involved in in Mississippi too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, um, they love it. Um, and you know, if you're, if you're putting a lot of, a lot of corn out for deer, 
you're gonna you're gonna you've probably seen plenty of trail camera camera photos of how raccoons can shinny <laughs> up a metal pole yeah. and hang mm-hmm. upside down and flip that little spinner and eat <laughs> corn all night and there'll be five of them underneath the feet uh, under the feeder eating the corn and you got one mm-hmm. guy up there spinning out feed and the other ones are filling up on corn on the ground and you know they're just fat and happy and making mm-hmm. a lot of baby coons so mm-hmm. um i you know there's there's a good things to everything and supplemental feeding is i i have mixed opinions on it um we put it out at times but we're real careful about never having any feed on the ground left if there's you know mm. if there um I don't want to introduce disease, but the thing that gets me, there's nothing, no, no feeders in the spring because those hens are, if you're, if you're feeding and turkeys are coming to the feeders there, it's like Grand Central Station. You've got trails going off to where they're going all spring mm-hmm. and your predators know that we've had supplemental feeding long enough that I think they've learned it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I get pictures of coyotes chasing a squirrel up a tree by under a feeder, um, mm-hmm. I just think that they've learned that that's a good place to go and start your hunt from or mm-hmm. find something you can ambush nearby. And I think that might, I can't prove it, but I wonder if it has some effect on your hen mortality and your nest mm-hmm. uh, making it through. It's just something following her on out, smelling yeah. turkey smells. Yeah. We don't, we don't really know, but it, I mean, it stands to reason that that probably does happen. I I have been trying to get that funded because I think it's important. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be interesting, really. I don't know uh, if you can, uh, were you thinking about like putting the GPS on them and and tracking them from these supplemental areas to see how many of them live uh, or are successful with their nests or or how would you do that? Well, there's a couple of things. I, I think the initial step that I would take is to tag hens and then see how frequently they visit feeders and whether right. or not that predicts their survival. And yeah. uh, then also, uh, I am real curious about whether or not they choose to nest near or avoid right. or are indifferent to a feeder location and what that how that if the distance to feeder affects their nesting success. I mean, we don't have, I mean, Will and I have done the, the review. We, we have tried to find the positives and negatives for turkeys, and we don't find much that would suggest a positive effect. I mean, it's yeah. pretty much all bad. So, well, and if you keep your predators trapped down and you have supplemental feeding, I think that's, that, that would help because they're Mm -hmm. not visiting that feeder but that means a really robust trapping program and you know how much time that takes Mm -hmm. i trapped when i with my dad all the time growing up that takes a commitment if you can't hire it done you've got to figure a way to do your own little part on your own piece of, of land and i a lot of people are just not big landowners like us Mm -hmm. we've got 210 acres well that's a lot to manage for us uh, and do it the way we really would like to. And just keeping just keeping hog traps monitored and the predators uh, trapped down during the season, not, not counting everything else you want to do, there's a lot of hours in the day that you devote to just trying to do that part of your management. So um, mm-hmm. it's a labor of love. We all yeah. love them, and we. And I know. I know a lot of know, folks. A, <laughs> a lot of folks tell us that they're like, "Yeah, I feed year round," but you know, I'm I'm always trapping around my feeders, and mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, that just feels a little bit like a band aid, you know. It's like uh, rather than treating the root cause, you know. Well, I I don't know. Uh, I don't a lot of them not. You're you're not allowed to keep feeders going. I don't even know the. We don't run feeders in the spring, so mm-hmm. but I would think just turning them off turning them off in the spring could help you know take Probably. away the take away the temptation <laughs> yeah to, well it's you can't hunt over them but right. i can say from the gobblers that we've collected across alabama 
if you look in the crops, I mean, this is from, I don't know, it's close to 900 birds. Mm-hmm. Um, about, you know, and, and keep in mind that a lot of those birds are killed shortly after they fly down. And like you were talking about earlier, they're not going to eat much mm-hmm. until, you know, like 10 o'clock in the morning once all the excitement dies down and they're just kind of loafing. So keep in mind that a lot of the birds that we, that we processed and looked through their crop contents of had not even eaten anything. Right. And we still saw that about 10% of birds had corn in their crops during the hunting season. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of corn still going out during that oh, time yeah. of year too. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there is. Um, How, what percentage didn't have any, anything in their crop? Will. I don't know. Uh, we just decided the other day that we were going to, we were going to look at it that way, but I, I haven't heard back, you know, okay. from the grad students. Mm-hmm. The afternoon cool. birds that you shoot are the most interesting than the crops because they've had a chance <laughs> to feed. And yeah. I have found some, you know, uh, pretty interesting stuff. Those empty crops in the morning, of course, I want to look at everything when, when I right. get around one, but, um, this one bird had, I, I laid it all out on a stump because he had a, he, he did a smorgasbord that day, but, uh, and it was a little bit later in the season. So, um, he was not strutting and breeding. He was hanging out trying to find a lone hen, you know, coming in, but he had 60 roly polies in him and <laughs> little tiny, uh, looks like slugs or something. And he had, like 44 water oak acorns and some various mm-hmm. grasses and leaves and some other bugs. And it was, it was pretty cool, but he found him a nice little spot of roly polies. That was, yeah. that was pretty neat. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, this has been fascinating conversation, but one life stage we haven't really talked any about, and I know that you have mm-hmm. filmed a lot of it because I've, I admire your photos of poults. So I'm just curious, do you have any stories about poults or anything that, you know, has stuck, stuck out to you that people could learn from? Um, I have, you know, I've, I've, that's one phase I, it's hard to do. It's hot weather. Yeah. And um, I, I can tell you, it, you've got to really want to do it to go in June. <laughs> <laughs> and sit in a clover field in the sunlight <laughs> and wait for those mamas to bring those those poults out. But I had a pretty good opportunity two years ago on a place uh, in Macon County. And uh, I, 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 that's where I really have developed a respect for these hens and what they go through. I mean, they're, three months out of the year, something could kill them at any moment and get their clutch and all. But the poults... Um, the, the hens are so wary, so alert when they've got the little ones. And these were about, these were just getting able to go up into the low hanging limbs and bushes and all. They were small. Mm-hmm. And um, it, they're, they're amazing to watch because they, they watch the hen and they try to do what she does, but they fight. And they're, you know, they're, they're little guys like this and they're already strutting and pulling. I mean, they're, they're grabbing the sides of their faces and, and pulling them down. And you've got some of them that are, that are just real bullies. Uh, But I'll tell you what was probably the neatest thing I saw about poults and when they're just getting where to, to get off the ground is they would, they do their flutter flying. They do all this little flutter flying as they're developing, I guess, that first three weeks, getting strengthening and, and all that. But that hen, there were two hens with, gosh, they had like 16 little ones between them. They were just little quail size, not about, <laughs> and they fed all over in the clover all around me. Um, but when it, when it got time to, to go to roost, the, the one hen walked through the, and it was pretty grassy stuff. She walked down the field line with her poults following her, and she stood where a water oak limb, low limb, came almost all foot from the ground. Mm-hmm. And she stood there and stood there, and then she, until they all got right there underneath her, and she flew up to the trunk. I couldn't see where she landed, but it, it just went right up about probably 
eight or ten feet off the ground where it joined the trunk. And one by one, those little guys fluttered up onto that low hanging limb and walk and I shot photos of them walking that limb up to <laughs> her. Amazing. And I think she she did that on purpose. I mean she I knew That's that one thinking. low hanging limb, that was the only one along that edge for about a hundred yards that hung low to the ground and she took those little ones knowing that would be easier you know, to get up off the ground. And I went back, I got up at three o'clock the next morning because I was hoping I could catch them coming down the limb. And um, <laughs> anyway, they got up and I could see her and I could take a, she actually went up probably 25 feet. I could see her up there, but I don't know if they, um, when they flew down the next morning, they just like dropped down in out of sight. It was fairly early and I couldn't, they didn't fl flutter out into the field, which I, you know, looking back, it was kind of dumb of me to think I was going to see these little guys sail out into the field. They were just kind of <laughs> yeah. like, okay, I'm going to jump off this limb and then wherever I land, I land. But, um, down. Yeah. I'm, kind of, I'm kind of fluffy, so. Yeah, they <laughs> bounce they when they, yeah. <laughs> but it was really neat to watch those uh, little ones get up off the ground and then the next day they went into some low into the, the timber and they um, preened on some low bushes in the afternoon rather than on the ground so they were you know i think they but they start trying to get up pretty early mm -hmm. yeah. to get they have that instinct yeah. to to go up but uh, I, I was able to at least document that you know that they walk up that limb going up to go to roost with the with the mama but that's mm -hmm. that's pretty neat i've never um I, i've photographed one hen that had little newly hatched they were just little bitty things but um I, just one opportunity and she was taking them through some low grass and all but uh just to, and they're not near as fragile as a little quail it's like a little puff ball yeah. <laughs> but um turkey poults it's amazing all your ground birds, baby ones, even can make it through the grass and stuff. It really it, is like a miracle. Make, that yeah, it is. And it's not so... Not any of them make it. Yeah, it, it makes you realize you've really got to make the ground ready and open enough for those little guys to move. And mm, that goes absolutely. back to what you guys preach and, and know the most, know a lot about is habitat. It's mm -hmm. burning and and trying to get that those openings that canopy underneath there because I, I, a photographer friend of mine told me once he said get down on the ground and look and you'll see what a what a turkey sees mm -hmm. and i think everybody that loves a turkey ought to lay down on the ground and look at their <laughs> property at the various seasons and see what a, what a turkey sees and i couldn't agree more it, it's <laughs> yeah. just do it get on your belly i've done get head high I've, to a turkey <laughs> and I've think can i walk through that uh, yeah, I've done some amateur photography where I just turned my phone upside down so that, <laughs> yeah. the, <laughs> so that the uh, camera is right by the ground. Yeah, but pe a lot of people have told me how much they appreciate being able to visualize what the Absolutely. like the structure I'm trying to tell them to try to yeah. create. That viewpoint has really changed the you know uh, how, how people take in that information and use it. So Absolutely. I, I completely it's understand a, it, what you're saying. It's like a light bulb goes off. It's like, mm, man, yeah. I never thought this is trashy looking down here. You know, yeah, I need to yeah. burn. I need what to What if I was one up. inch tall? I would not yeah. like this. Think yeah. About, think about not a, at all. a baby quail. I, it just amazes me. God just, if you don't believe in God, you need to go follow some quail and turkeys around. <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> he, he, he made it, uh, you know. Uh, and that, that's one thing it, about photographing turkeys and, and uh, hunting, too, is, you know, creation is what he put here for us to manage. You know, we're, we're to have dominion over the creatures. And, and that, to me, that's a call to conservation. It's a message. Mm -hmm. And when you're in nature, it's him. You know, he's and that iridescence on a turkey or even just a, a hen is a beautiful creature. And, you know, mm -hmm. in her own right, um, she is this 
Turkeys for Tomorrow organization, that's their theme this year is Year of the Hen. We've got to make people or let people know that they've got a hard job. They've got a big mm-hmm. burden, and there's so many things we can all do to, um, to help them. So, mm-hmm. And w- what you all do really does. This habitat mm-hmm. management and just all of the research, it's just um, – I love the awakening that's out there among turkey hunters. You probably have felt it. Mm -hmm. Um, I go to these banquets and people are like, man, we just really, we like this as much as hunting. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's the one good thing that technology and the connectedness that we have nowadays nowadays has brought us is it's Mm -hmm. helped catalyze, you know, this movement and kind of organizing people. Yeah. And to work towards a common goal. your, Your contribution with this podcast is so critical because like with turkeys for tomorrow we can do we, you know direct people to the podcast hunters that can learn more and you speak in the language that we can all as lay people understand and mm. um, i think that connectivity with the with the researchers has been I've never felt that in the past. You know, I've, yeah. you, you read you read your agency magazines and things like that. I'm not saying that there wasn't information there, but this has personalized it with social mm-hmm. media. These people mm-hmm. know you. They love what you do. I know that probably you get inundated with questions and all, but you're serving of a great, being of great service to the wild turkey. That's the way I feel about it. Well, I, I certainly appreciate you saying that and i hope you know that's what we hope to do so oh i, we, I think you all have have done well with this podcast <laughs> it's well we've, we've it has, been trying. <laughs> it, you've done a great job uh, it's um it's been well received i think we appreciate that you know marcus i know you got to run in a couple minutes um so i just wanted to make sure that tess if there was anything else that that you wanted to share, uh, you know, that you haven't got a chance to yet that we, we left a couple minutes for you to do that. Now, uh, all I would say is just to, to, to listeners to just keep listening to this podcast and, and uh, just know that there's going to be new research, you know, coming out and anything uh, for me, the observations of people in the field are important to you all as well. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, really good that mm-hmm. we have an we have an outlet now that where we can say i saw this what does this mean or i've got this problem with turkeys or whatever i think mm-hmm. um this is just really important with some of the declines that we've seen in turkey populations over the last six eight years that um the time is now and, and it's just refreshing to see everybody pulling together and that's one thing we want to do is keep the hunting community together, the the nature loving community, people mm-hmm. whether they hunt or not, but they love to watch turkeys. We just, you know, we can all find common ground to to see what we can do and help yeah. our neighbors. You no. Know? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's one thing I've really appreciated about you, Tess, other than the, the absolutely beautiful photography is you clearly have loved the resource and passionate about it and have continued mm-hmm. that on for a long time. And we really appreciate that. <laughs> it's inspiring. It's, yeah. it's very, it's, it inspires me. Um, and I think it inspires a lot of people too. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's what we really need to harness and catalyze is, you know, we have mm-hmm. a lot, a really passionate group of people that really care about this. And yeah. if we can make sure we point that passion in the right direction, then, you know, great. It's going to be great for turkeys. It it will, and I never get tired of being out there. <laughs> You'd think after 25 years, but <laughs> you just yeah. it, it, never get tired of it. And I'm the glad you all are the impressive. next generation coming to <laughs> to carry it on. Yeah. I'm going to plan to be out there as long as good Lord lets me. Yeah. But and thank you very much. A lot longer. Yeah. I appreciate it. A very, well, very Marcus, much. you go do your thing, and we're going to stay here, and we're going to keep talking turkeys with Tess. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you we yeah, won't really, talk about really, you. Really, <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, I mean, I, I could sit here and listen to you tell me all the really amazing things you've seen. I wish I could for, you know, hours. 
But, I've got a yeah. book in me, but I haven't got the time to write it yet. I just hope I can get to that before I die. Yeah. Well, we'll, I'm we'll have happy to, to help. Uh, yeah, we'll, yeah we'll I need to, to dictate help. it to somebody. There you go. Well, maybe we could just have you dictate it on here. We'll just have you back there for you each go. chapter. There you go. Oh, that would be perfect. I would, that would that yeah. would be one thing I would dream. My, one of my bucket list items is to, to try to leave some of this behind that I've seen and compile it all. I have a lot of it, but I just haven't compiled it because I want to be out there with my camera. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the hard part. <laughs> yeah. Well, we sure appreciate that you're doing it and and I appreciate you, you know, uh, spreading the word about turkeys and the passion. You bet. We're, we're all in the same, same focus. We just keep going Thank forward you, with them. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University podcast network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow, a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey. To learn more about TFT, check out turkeysfortomorrow.org.